1. juni så meldte altså Donald Trump i går altså at han melder USA ut av Parisavtalen. Ja, på plass her i studio så har vi fått Austin Rasmussen som er leder for Republicans Abroad, og også Audrey Kemp som er leder for Democrats Abroad Norway. Welcome for, to both of you. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Rasmussen, what do you think about Trump pulling the United States out of the Paris uh, Agreement? Well, we can't be entirely surprised as this is one of his key campaign promises. This is something that he intended to do from the very beginning. Uh, but do you support it? And I support it. It was uh, one uh, of the relatively small list of things that he was intending on doing as a candidate and now as president that I do fully support. And I Why? Why? Well, first and foremost, the way that the United States was forced into the Paris Agreement under the previous, uh, under Obama's administration, unilaterally done by the executive branch, uh, and not given to Congress to pass approval on, I, I found that to be uh, against our principles and against our values as a republic. So putting that out, or pulling us out of the Paris Agreement, if the United States uh, as a people wants to go back into that agreement, then it's something that should go through the United States Congress and then end up on the desk of the president for him to sign into law, not for somebody like Obama to unilaterally sign into law without uh, including the other two branches of government. Okay, mm. but that's a principal argument for, for leaving the Paris Agreement. But do you, uh, do, do you think there is something wrong with the agreement like it is today? Well, as I said, that was first and foremost. Uh, when it comes to the agreement itself, yes, I'm morally opposed to governments coming together in an international setting and then implementing their will on the rest of the on the rest of the world here you have leaders flying in their fossil fuel private jets uh, to meet in one place and then telling the average citizen uh, imposing on the average citizen uh, inevitable increases in their energy costs not only that uh, impeding industry impeding innovation these are problems take climate change or take our uh, dislike for fossil fuels in the modern world, these are things that will be uh, uh, fixed and resolved by the market. Uh, technologies and innovation and competing forces, not by politicians getting in a room and deciding what's best for everyone. Let's listen to the Democrats. Uh, do you buy these arguments? Absolutely not. But I think that, uh, as Austin said, I'm not surprised by this either. I don't think any Democrat is. I mean, we're very familiar with President Trump now. Um, he's been president for 132 days. He's, he was campaigning for 500 days. Um, we know him and we know his character. And so he was delivering on a promise, but it was a promise that was set to a very small segment, I think, of his most um, ardent followers. And I think that, um, I think Austin, you referred to it as a small promise. I, I sort of agree. It's not that I'm not disappointed. I absolutely am, but I'm not shocked. And so, sort of in the words of um, California Governor Jerry Brown, you know, this is unfortunate, maybe even tragic, but um, we'll overcome it together. And it's, uh, I think in my case, a, a trust in the spirit of cooperation between nations. I don't have a knee-jerk distrust for cooperation between governments, especially governments that are elected by the people. Mm. Mm. But what will happen now, do you think, in the U.S. with the, the climate uh, case? Well, I think that, for example, as a candidate, Trump called climate change a hoax perpetuated by the Chinese, and it was a strange, you know, Twitter-length thing for him to claim, but it was um, a nod to, again, a certain small segment of his following. Um, and so he was never going to make good on that. He was never going to make pro-science, pro-planet Democrats proud of him in this moment. Um, at the same time, his removal is so symbolic in a sense because the agreement was non-binding and there was so much room for um, for each country to dictate its own terms in, um, of what it would deliver and its own goals. And so he could have uh, stayed at the table and advocated for the Americans he claims to love and the American workers he claims to support. He could have done that at the table. Um, his choice to step away doesn't accomplish anything more than this sort of symbolic uh, removal of the largest climate polluter in the world from that table. And so that's again an example of President Trump confusing showmanship with leadership. Mm. First, the United States is not the largest uh, emitter in the world, that would be China. And after that, as Trump, and when he did his announcement uh, about pulling out of the climate uh, agreement at the White House, uh, he did highlight a lot of 
very deafening facts when it comes to China and India and what they are allowed to do within the Paris Agreement and what we are, what's expected of the United States in contributing, for example, to the Green Energy Fund, which siphons money to countries that supposedly can afford green energy. And this is all being done at the backs of the American taxpayer. This is something, uh, when you say a small portion of Trump's uh, base, it's not a small portion. He is president of the United States. This was not a small promise. It was a key campaign promise. And this was something that he was elected on doing. And he did it. And he fulfilled that promise. But do you not believe that this is a global responsibility, that the U.S. also have a responsibility to be part of an agreement that, the, that so many countries are supporting? I don't think but this is a globally enforceable responsibility on anyone. I think that this is something that can be solved and resolved by the market, technology and improvements in competing forces within that market. Uh, this isn't something where, again, politicians should be getting in the room. There's too many moving parts. You have 7 billion people on the world, and you're going to expect a room full of politicians that are going to dictate. Uh, they're going to save the world, essentially, is what they're telling us. And if that's really the case, if the United States pulling out of the Paris Agreement is so apocalyptic and signaling the end of the world because of global warming, because we are one of the larger emitters uh, on the planet, then why is it that the European leaders, when Trump, in his announcement, said... I'm more than willing to come back to the table and renegotiate terms that are better for the American citizens. And the European leaders hands down said, no, we will continue without you. So if it is so apocalyptic and it isn't about siphoning money out of the United States, then why weren't they more open-minded to his offer about renegotiating other terms or a new agreement altogether? Uh, Camp, we, no, we now know that about 30 states uh, disagree with, uh, mm -hmm. with Trump. A lot of big companies like Apple, Google, uh, Tesla, Facebook, mm -hmm. yeah, Facebook are, are going to proceed with the, with the climate issues, uh, regardless of what the Trump uh, administration has done now. Does that comfort you? Well, it is comforting. I'm from Silicon Valley, so I appreciate all of that. I think that it's, it's, it's showing, it's telling that um, the corporate world, um, which oftentimes is more conservative, has decided that this is an, a more important issue and it's not about partisanship. It's about making sure that you're doing something for the future. And the future of every industry is dependent on a healthy planet. So this is, um, I think it's fascinating to see the, the, these dynamic shifts in, in different industries. And I'm also very proud of California. I'm proud of New York. I, I said in a, in a Facebook post for Democrats Abroad Norway that this is possibly an opportunity for liberals to start to reappreciate mm. the idea of states' rights. Well, um, can, can I say one thing to that end? Um, you're making my point here that the corporate world is voluntarily subjecting themselves to the Paris Agreement without a federal mandate to do so. And this is exactly what I'm talking about, where the markets will resolve these issues based on their own voluntary will to do so, not based on government force or a gun held to their head. Although that. oftentimes I don't think it's about a gun held to the head so much as it is about identification of prioritization. I think that making that assumption that government leaders get into a room and make this decision and we're all required to step in line is, is a misnomer, especially since this was non-binding and there were five years to come up with the first set of goals. And Trump could have done that. He could have stayed at the table and represented the American people and said, as a leader, I'm going to stay here and because 70 percent of you believe that I should. And I'm going to stay here and I'm going to find terms that are better for the American citizen. He could have done that, too. We have, to move, we have to move on. Thank you both for coming. Absolutely. Thank you.